This is In the Shadow of Man, Chapter 4. Camp Life. Memsab, Memsab. Gradually the voice penetrated the depth of my sleep. I sat up. Please come. You are wanted, said the voice, disembodied from behind the light of a small hurricane lamp. It was Adolf. When I asked him what was wrong, he was vague, but I gathered it was something to do with the sick baby. By this time, Van was awake too, and so we both put on a few clothes and followed Adolf through the darkness. He led us to the little village on the other side of the stream, down on the beach. There the two game scouts lived, together with the honorary headman, old Edi Matata, his large family, and about a dozen fishermen in their temporary dry-season huts. Presently you arrived. Presently, we arrived at the large mud brick and thatched hut of Old Edie. It was past midnight, but everyone was awake, talking and laughing in the smoke-filled main room. Two children scuttled into the shadows as we went in, and Edie's chief wife, who was nursing her twin sons, smiled a greeting to us. Adolf took us to a doorway leading into a smaller room where it looked very dark and stood aside for us to go in. And then we realised what it was we were called for. A young woman lay on the earth floor and beside her a tiny baby, still attached to its mother by the umbilical cord. Quite obviously, the afterbirth was somehow stuck. The father was in there looking rather worried and one young girl, but no one else seemed to be paying much attention to the situation. We were faced with a dilemma. We wanted to help, but knew nothing about midwifery. And if anything happened to the mother, we should without doubt be held responsible. We soon discovered that the baby... (coughs) We soon discovered that the baby had been born five hours earlier and that it was a first child. The mother, it seemed, felt only a little pain, but was very cold. We suggested that the cord should be cut and the baby wrapped up, but this was greeted with horrified protest. Such conduct would apparently violate time-honoured traditions. I went for a blanket and some brandy and roused Dominic to make hot tea, and these things seemed to bring back some life and energy to the poor mother. Van and I both felt convinced that some of the other African women there must know far more about childbirth than we did. So we went out to talk to Edie's head wife with Adolf, who was still hanging around so that he could translate. She agreed to come and see what she could do as soon as the twins had finished their feed. Presently she came in with a brighter lamp and some warm palm nut oil, which she massaged onto the girl's belly and between her thighs, meanwhile gently pulling at the cord. Ten minutes later, the afterbirth was delivered. Then, at last, old Edie came in and with a pair of ceremonial scissors, proudly cut the cord of his grandchild and himself tied the knot. By the way, the scissors were rusty. We asked Dominic to make the mother some soup congratulated the father who was beaming with relief and retired to our beds, having actually done very little, but feeling nevertheless we'd accomplished quite a lot. This excursion into midwifery was but one of Van's medical tasks, for, as custom demanded in those days, we had arrived at the Gombe stream well supplied with simple medicines, aspirins and ointments, elastoplast and epsom salts, Quite soon after our arrival, Van found herself running a well-attended clinic every morning. David Anstey, before he left, had told the neighbouring Africans that Van and I would be pleased to try to treat small ailments. And quite a number had arrived during the first few days, mainly, I suspect, to have a good look at these two strange white women who had so surprisingly abandoned civilization. But then one day a very sick man with a hugely swollen leg was helped to our camp. 
He had two deep tropical ulcers on the lower part of his leg. After Van had done a little preliminary cleaning, she realised to her horror that the ulceration had already begun to eat away the bone. She begged the man to go to the Kigoma hospital, but he absolutely refused. People only went there to die. They all said that back then. And so Van treated him herself with an old-fashioned cure, a saline drip. Every morning and every afternoon, the patient sat down with a large bowl of blood-warm salted water, which he dripped very slowly over his sores. After three weeks, the swelling had gone and the wounds were clean. Subsequently, it was only a matter of time before he was completely healed. Word spread fast. After that, Van's clinics were enormous and people trudged along the beaches or over the mountains for long distances. One of Rashidi's sons, eight-year-old Jumani, Swahili for Tuesday, appointed himself as Van's orderly and helped her almost every morning, mixing the Epsom salts, pouring out water for aspirins, cutting the elastoplast. He was particularly helpful in spotting those who sneaked round to join the queue again, hoping for a second dose. The only payment Jumaine required was a small piece of elastoplast on some microscopic or sometimes imaginary wound. Van's clinics not only cured many maladies, but most importantly, helped us to establish good relations with our new neighbors. The suspicions which were rife on our arrival, were soon dispelled. The Africans, indeed, continued to think we were both slightly crazy, but they were prepared to be friendly, for they realised we were genuine. Nor was it long before some of them became interested in the work that I was doing. One day, Dominic told me he'd heard of an old man, Mrisho, who had watched four chimpanzees with sticks chasing away a lion. This man lived in a little village up in the hills, just outside the eastern boundary of the reserve. Would I like to go and talk to Mbrisho and see where the incident had taken place? It seemed an unlikely story, but I knew that lions had occasionally been observed in the area by previous game rangers. Also, I was curious to visit Bubango village and see the country on the other side of the rift. And so early one morning, I set off with the man from the village as my guide and the tall willowy Wilbert to interpret, for his English was quite good and my Swahili was still very bad. It was a long, hot climb and took four hours of pretty steady walking. We passed a procession of African women walking down to the temporary fishing huts on the beach, balancing great bundles on their heads with graceful ease and chattering and laughing like brightly coloured birds. At one point, when I'd stopped to watch a troop of red colobus monkeys, six men passed us, climbing up to the village. One of them was old with a slightly bent back and silver hair, but he seemed quite unconcerned by the steepness of the ascent and the heat of the sun. These men walked with a special springy stride of mountain folk and each time they placed their stout staffs on the ground, they exhaled their breath with an eerie flute-like whistle. As we climbed higher, the countryside changed. More and more trees were festooned with feathery grey-green lichen of the upper slopes, and the open spaces were covered with short springy grass, so that I was reminded of the Sussex Downs. From the top of the rift, the view was superb, and in those days, rolling forested country stretched away to the east as far as I could see. Today, much of the forest has been cleared, and African huts and cultivation have marched from all sides towards the boundary of the chimpanzee sanctuary. The village of Babango sprawled below us, just on the other side of the mountain top. It was larger than I'd expected were groves of banana and palm trees clustered in the greenness of the valley, and on the slopes of the hillside many patches of cassava. 
cassava root ground into a fine white flour and subsequently cooked with water into a porridge is a staple diet in the area. The huts were mostly rather small and simple, with mud walls and thatched roofs, and a crisscross of tracks, worn bare by the passage of countless human feet, led from the huts to the stream and to the patches of cultivation. Small children herded goats and sheep, and I even saw a few cows grazing here and there. The little hut of Oldenbury Show stood off to the side of the main dirt track, that wound down through the village from the top of the escarpment. He welcomed us in, gave us tea and some delicious doughy African cakes, and beamed widely as he told me the lion story in his slow, deep voice. Every so often his conversation was punctuated by a long drawn out nam. It soon transpired that it was not Mbrisho who had seen the chimps and the lion, but some long dead relative so that I was none the wiser about that when I left. But I had gained a firm and staunch friend in Mbrisho. He never fails to bring a gift of eggs, carefully wrapped up in a piece of cloth when he comes down the mountain to visit our camp. And when a man lives off the land and is old, a few eggs are a really valuable present and one which we were proud to accept. Mrisho, like most of the able-bodied men of the surrounding villages, was a fisherman until he retired. The principal catch is the small sardine-sized dagar, which is caught at night in orange or red-dyed nets, shaped like gigantic butterfly nets. Each canoe, manned by two fishermen, is equipped with two or more bright paraffin pressure lamps. The fish, attracted by the light, rise to the surface and are scooped up in the net. Whenever a big shoal is sighted, the fishermen start to sing, stamping with their feet, banging against the boat with paddle on their handle. And this apparently encourages the fish to rise. When fishing is good, it sounds as though all the human inhabitants for miles around are having a fantastic party on the lake, making it very difficult for us to sleep. When the bottom of a canoe is filled with fish, the catch is paddled back to the shore, where other men start spreading it out on special drying beds of fine gravel. If fishing is good, each canoe may return two or three times in a night, and the rising sun is reflected from millions and millions of tiny scales, so that the beaches seem changed to silver. During the day, the fishermen, or their wives or children, periodically work their way up and down the drying beds, prodding at the fish with long sticks, turning them so that the sun dries them evenly on both sides. And then, in the evening, the catch is gathered up into sacks, while the men, who will go out fishing, sit around their grass huts, talking, and their women folk prepare the evening meal of ugali, or cassava porridge, mixed with dried dagar. Dagar in red palm nut oil. When the moon is bright, the Dagar are no longer attracted towards the lamps of the canoes, and during this period, the dried fish are taken to Kigoma for sale. Mostly they are loaded onto the small 30-foot motorized boats which ply up and down the lake shore. At the peak of the season, these water taxis, as we call them, are loaded with sack upon sack of fish for the Dugar industry is a profitable one. A great deal is sold locally, but even more is railed away to other parts of East Africa and to the great copper mines of Nyanza in the south. The fishermen who do not go to Kigoma return to their home villages to visit their families, and so for ten days or so each month the beaches of the Gombe stream are deserted. At such times I loved walking along the lake shore when my work took me to some distant valley. In the early morning, I occasionally met the lumbering shape of a hippo returning to the water after a night's feeding on the lush grass along the lake shore. Bush bucks and bush pigs often moved along the beaches between the valleys, and once I saw a small herd of buffalo looking huge and very black against the white sand. There was always a chance, too, 
of seeing some of the smaller animals, one of the mongooses perhaps, or a slender dainty genet with its ring tail, or a larger thick-set civet cat. One evening, when I was wading in the shallows of the lake to pass a rocky outcrop, I suddenly stopped dead as I saw the sinuous black body of a snake in the water. It was all of six foot long, and from the slight hood and dark stripes at the back of the neck, I knew it to be a storm's water cobra, a deadly reptile for the bite of which there was at that time no serum. As I stared at it, an incoming wave gently deposited part of its body on one of my feet. I remained motionless, not even breathing, I think, until the wave rolled back into the lake drawing the snake with it. Then I leapt out of the water as fast as I could, my heart hammering. A few weeks before, I had encountered another cobra, one of the white-lipped variety, which, aiming for its victim's eyes, can spit venom from as far away as six feet and cause temporary or even permanent blindness. At the time, I'd been standing looking over the valley and had glanced down to see the snake gliding between my legs. It had paused momentarily, testing the canvas of my shoe with its sensitive flickering tongue. But I felt no fear whatsoever, for there had been no chance of a sudden wave dashing it against me and making it frightened, no suction of water that might coil it around my ankle. There was something utterly unnerving about a snake in the water. Lake Tanganyika is one of the few areas of fresh water in East Africa which is virtually free of the dreaded Bilhartsia snail, at least in the Kigoma and Gombe area, and the water is cool, sparkling clean, and excellent for swimming. In those early days, I never had time for swimming, not that I felt any great desire to plunge into the water after my experience with the snake, and after hearing about Chico's experience. Chico was Dominic's wife, who, with her little girl, had joined us soon after arrival at Gombe. One day, when she was standing in the shallow water, doing her washing, there was a sudden swirling a few feet away. With a shriek, she leapt out onto the shore, staring in horror at the place where but a moment before she had seen a crocodile. It wasn't a very big crocodile, I had myself seen it a few times swimming in the lake, but I shouldn't have liked to meet it in the water. Chico's experience, however, became the joke of the moment. Every African I met for the next few weeks was laughing about the crocodile that tried to grab my cook's wife. Dominic himself, when he told me, laughed till the tears ran down his face. It is when the fishermen leave their huts during the full moon that the baboons come into their own on the beaches. All along the shoreline, where there are drying beds, the troops gather, searching through the pebbles for leftover scraps of dried fish. They sift through the sand around the huts too, probably looking for specks of cassava scattered where the women pounded the roots into flour for porridge. The Africans remove anything of value when they leave the beaches, for the baboons are very destructive. I've watched them pulling apart a whole roof as they search through the thatch for insects, and they move in and out of the huts as though they own them, eating anything edible, investigating or pulling apart anything that is not. The baboons very soon made themselves at home around our camp too, and Van quickly learned never to leave the tents unguarded. About two weeks after our arrival, she went for a short walk. When she returned, it was to find our belongings strewn in all directions, and one blasé male baboon sitting by the overturned table, polishing off the loaf Dominic had baked that morning. Van was particularly incensed by the way the others barked at her from the surrounding trees, as though challenging her right to her own home. It was not long after this episode that Van, during a visit to the Camp Lou, or Cho as it is known in East Africa, looked up to see five large old male baboons sitting around in a semicircle and watching her. She told me that evening 
that she felt frightfully embarrassed for a moment because the baboons caught her with her trousers down. It was far worse when one morning Van, who had been dozing after my early departure, suddenly heard a small sound in the tent. She opened her eyes and there, silhouetted in the entrance, she saw a huge male baboon. He and she remained motionless for a few moments and then he opened his mouth in a huge yawn of threat. In the grey light of dawn, Van could just see the gleam of his teeth and she thought her last hour had come. With a sudden yell, she sat bolt upright in bed, waving her arms, and the unwelcome visitor fled. He was a horrible baboon, that one, an old male who took to hanging around our camp at all hours of the day, lurking in the undergrowth and dashing out whenever opportunity presented to steal a loaf of bread or some other item of food. We called him Shaitani, which is Swahili for devil, and we were immensely relieved when he suddenly disappeared. In those days, food was precious, not only because of our limited budget, but also because both Van and I hated Kigoma days, when we had to go into the town to renew our supplies and collect our mail. We went as little as possible, but once every three or four weeks, we had to make the expedition. We used to set off at about six in the morning when the lake was usually calm and breakfast at the hotel when we arrived. Then we trailed round doing the shopping, bargaining at the fruit and vegetable market, ordering tinned goods for the next month and queuing in the post office. We always had a pleasant interlude at midday, for we were invariably invited to lunch by one or other of the friends we'd made during our initial stay in Kigoma. Indeed, they often <clears throat> tried to persuade us to stay the night. And most of them thought I was merely being antisocial when I explained it was bad enough to leave my work for one day and I couldn't think of staying away for a second. At first, we used to take Dominic with us on these expeditions. He was amazingly loyal and would bargain heatedly in the market so that we shouldn't be overcharged by as much as a farthing. But after a while, we realized that it was better to leave Dominic to look after camp. The locally made beer brewed from fermented bananas is strong and drinking is Dominic's weakness. On several occasions, we couldn't find him at all when it came to the appointed time to leave. Once he didn't turn up again for a week and we had to manage without him. And we shall never forget the day when, though we did manage to find him in time to return with us, he was in a very merry state. Laughing at nothing, he accompanied us to the boat and half stepped, half fell in. He's an intelligent man and often very amusing with a little drunk. He soon had Van and I laughing with him, and we were a gay party as we cast off and chugged out of the Kigoma Bay. By this time it was almost dark, but the search for Dominic had delayed us. Normally I steered a course quite close to shore, but that evening the water was dotted with fishermen canoes paddling out from their shore, and they were hard to see in the dust. So I drove the boat along half a mile or more from the beach. Quite suddenly, when we were about a quarter of the way home, the engine stopped. Nothing we did produced even a spark, and none of us knew anything about engines. All we could do was to row to shore. Dominic announced proudly that he would row us in. Seating himself centrally, he seized the two oars, settled himself, and gave a mighty pull. He caught a whopping grab and the next moment was lying flat out on top of one of the large baskets of fruit from the market. He couldn't get out for laughing. Eventually we hauled him back onto the seat and I said that I would row. But this was too much for his sense of propriety. At least he must take one oar. For the next ten minutes we proceeded to turn in small circles around his oar. Finally I persuaded him I could manage but I loved rowing more than anything, and off we set. When we eventually reached the beach, we found to our delight 
that one of the water taxis was anchored there. A crowd of fishermen soon gathered around us, and before long the driver of the taxi was found. After much arguing, he agreed to transport us and our little boat back to camp. But Dominic was incensed at the price we were to be charged. Telling us to wait, he vanished into the night before we could stop him. We had a long wait, but we didn't want to leave without Dominic. Also, we were grateful to him for thinking of our purse, for it was indeed very slender. Thirty minutes later, he returned with four stalwart Africans. These men, Dominic informed us, would paddle us home. They were friends of his, and they would only charge us a quarter of the price demanded by the motorized water taxi. This sounded marvellous until we discovered that even with eight men rowing hard it would take more than eight hours to get home. I think Dominic never quite forgave us for taking the faster vessel and allowing ourselves to be robbed. It was not long after this that Van, who had gone to Kigoma without me, had a much worse experience. Dominic was not with her, but the willowy Wilbert had asked to go in, as he wanted to do some shopping. He and Van parted in the morning and arranged to meet back at the boat at five o'clock. When he finally appeared half an hour late, Van's heart sank. He was another victim of Kigoma's banana beer. Wilbert, staggering slightly, swayed up to the boat and then, to Van's horror, pulled out a knife, which he waved around, whilst with staring eyes he began to mutter incoherently about death and revenge. Van admitted that she'd been frightened, for Wilbert, willowy though he appeared, was a very large man indeed, and he looked terrifying with his eyes bloodshot and the blade of the knife glinting in the evening sun. However, she kept her head, spoke to him quietly, and asked him to let her look after the knife in case he cut himself getting into the boat. To her surprise, he stared hard at her, and then a bewildered expression came over his face. He lurched towards her, handed her the knife, and without another word, climbed into the boat. It was very quiet during the trip home. We never did discover what it was all about, and Wilbert never asked for his knife back. How lucky I was to have a mother like Van, a mother in a million. I couldn't have done without her during those early days. She ran the clinic and ensured the goodwill of my neighbours. She kept the camp neat. She pressed and dried for me the specimens of the chimps, food plants that I collected. And above all, she helped me to keep up my spirits during the depressing weeks when I could get nowhere near the chimps. How nice it was to come back in the evening and find a warm welcome. How pleasant to be able to discuss the events of the day, frustrating or exciting, over the fire during supper and to hear the gossip of the camp. Van put up with the most primitive conditions without a murmur. We lived in those early days on baked beans, corned beef, and other tinned meats and vegetables. We had no refrigerator. We bathed at night in a tiny canvas tub, supported at each corner by a wooden frame and filled with a few inches of water. Too hot when one got in and cold when one got out a few moments later. Sometimes giant hairy spiders took refuge in our tent and twice Van woke up in the morning to see the flattened, evil-looking body of a deadly giant centipede clinging to the roof of the tent above her bed. And as if all this wasn't enough, there was something in the water that disagreed with Van's never strong stomach, so that she seldom if ever felt 100% fit. Five months after our arrival, Van had to return to England. The authorities in Kigoma no longer worried about me being on my own. I was by then part of the Gombe stream landscape, and thanks to Van's clinics, I enjoyed excellent relationships with the local inhabitants. Just before Van left, we were joined by Hassan, our old friend from Lake Victoria. We were overjoyed to see him. Van was able to go 
knowing I was in reliable hands. The son would drive the little boat and do the awful Kigoma days on his own. And if anything happened, Hassan somehow would cope. For Hassan had often proved himself in times of crisis during his 30 years with Lewis. My fire seemed lonely when Van had gone. Even Terry the Toad, who had become our nightly companion, served only to remind me of the times Van and I had laughed at him together as he gorged himself on the insects around the lamp. And on the evenings when Crescent the Genet came softly towards the tent to take a banana, I found myself wishing Van was there to share in my appreciation of her slender grace. As the weeks passed, however, I accepted her loneliness as a way of life, and I was no longer lonely. I was utterly absorbed in my work, fascinated by the chimps, too busy in the evenings to brood. In fact, had I been alone for longer than a year, I might have become a rather strange person, for inanimate objects began to develop their own identities. I found myself saying, good morning, to my little hut on the peak, hello, to the stream where I collected my water. And I became immensely aware of trees, just to feel the roughness of a gnarled trunk or the cold smoothness of young bark with my hand filled me with a strange knowledge of the roots under the ground and the pulsing sap within. I longed to be able to swing through the branches like the chimps, to sleep in the treetops, lulled by the rustling of the leaves. In particular, I loved to sit in the forest when it was raining, and to hear the pattering of the drops on the leaves, and feel utterly enclosed in a dim twilight world of greens and browns and dampness. End of chapter 4